All right, so are you guys ready to go on the questions? Do we have any questions? We got them. Okay, we're ready to roll. All right, so this relates to the resurrection and what Aaron was just saying, that we're still celebrating the resurrection, the resurrection this week. And so the first question is, what happened to Jesus between death and his resurrection? Did he go to hell to beat Satan, or did he just stay dead? Okay, that's a great question. That's a great question. Now, the question comes up a lot, I think, because people who say the Apostles' Creed a lot, so particularly people from a Lutheran background, will hear in their doctrinal statement that Jesus descended into hell. Are you guys familiar with that statement at all? But oftentimes people say, well, where is that in the Bible? Is there a Bible verse for that? And the answer is kind of. It's fuzzy. So there's three different views that are related to that. I'm a big fan of the Apostles' Creed, except for that little phrase, descended into hell, because it's just not that clear. So view number one is that Jesus actually descended into hell. Now those of you who have heard my teaching on hell know there's two words for hell in the New Testament. One of them is Gehenna, that's for the burning garbage dump, that's the weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's the flames and fire and all that kind of stuff. View number one says Jesus goes to Gehenna, he actually takes our sins as a load, he unfolds them into hell, gets them separated from us so that they can never affect us anymore, and then beats Satan and winds up uh, coming back. Now, beating Satan is bad theology because Satan is not in hell yet. I think you guys know that. He gets thrown into hell at the end of the age. Right now, he's prowling around here like a roaring lion, but Jesus could go to hell and throw uh, the sins in there. The passages that people would go to to talk about that would be Ephesians chapter 4, okay, Ephesians chapter 4, which says, what does he ascended mean other than that he also descended into the lower earthly regions? So there's two interpretations of that. One is that he descended to lower earthly regions means he went to hell. Other scholars will say he descended to lower earthly regions just means he got laid into the tomb. Okay, so it could mean either one of those. But people who espouse this first view say that means he descended into hell. And then there's this verse in 1 Peter 3. And I'm telling you, this is a challenge verse that I'll tell you even before I say it, I don't have any idea what it means. You guys ever have any Bible verses like that where you're like, I studied it over and over and I still don't know what it means. So 1 Peter 3.15 is one of those verses for me, not 3.15, but it's in 1 Peter 3, that talks about how Jesus preached to the spirits who were in prison. And I don't know exactly what it means that Jesus preached to the spirit who were in prison, but one of the views of uh, the idea that Jesus went to hell is that he went to give people a second chance to be able to repent and bring them back to heaven. Now, this is not my theological viewpoint, but people who hold this viewpoint, some genuine Christians who are good people hold it, will hold 1 Peter 3.15 as a part of that equation. So Jesus died, went into hell, took our sins away, preached to the spirits who were in prison, came back. Viewpoint number two is that when Jesus died, he went to Hades. Now, Hades is the second word that's used in the New Testament to talk about death, and it parallels the Old Testament word Sheol that talks about what happens after you die. So you go to Sheol or Hades, and these are just kind of a shadowy, death-like reality where you kind of go and you're in this fuzzy gray ether world awaiting judgment. So some people say if they believe in that kind of a holding tank, that waiting world, that Jesus went to this waiting world, this holding tank for a while, and then he came back on Resurrection Sunday. Some people will add the 1 Peter 3.15 part and say he preached to the spirits who are in prison there. Then there are other people who hold to this time warp view of eternity. The idea on this one is that when you die, you are no longer bound by the time on planet Earth, but instead your body translates to God time, which does not work the same as our time. So that God time could be a very long time, or it could be a very short time. Does that make sense on planet Earth? Because time works different for God than it works for us. God created time. He exists outside of time. He can move through time with no problems. You guys all tracking with this so far? So if you die, your time is not three days until you rise again. It could be a long time or a short time. And uh, that you can go and uh, be available, like you can time warp straight to the other period of time uh, on Sunday morning. And that's another legitimate viewpoint, that Jesus didn't have to experience anything in between those two. 
but that he would come back three days later. Now this all gets a little bit more convoluted because you guys know when Jesus came back, his body was not the same as his original body, right? He did things like walk through walls, appear with disciples, show up in disguise, disappear in front of his disciples, but at the same time, he did have a body which had wounds in it, and he ate fish with his disciples, and so he's got a body, but it's not the same kind of body that he had beforehand. So what happened with his body during that time? Somehow during that time, his body got glorified, but he says afterwards, I have not yet ascended to the Father. <laughs> so how did his body get glorified without ascending to the Father? I don't know. I don't know. And nobody asked that, so I'm not going to try to answer it right now. <laughs> but we know that that's one of those things that happen in that in-between time. So Jesus' body is laid in the tomb, boom, on Friday. On Sunday, we know the body's not there, but the linens are there like a shell. So at some point, his body got translated out made into a different, really cool kind of a body, and then he comes back here to planet Earth. Those are the theories that are behind it. So you say, did Jesus actually go into hell and beat up Satan? Well, he wouldn't have beat up Satan in hell for sure, but he may have taken our sins to hell, or there may have been something else that happened in the meantime, and when we get face-to-face -face with Jesus, we can ask him ourselves. <laughs> All right, great question. Thank you. I think Dave asked that question, so thank you for that. For the skeptics in the room that Mark has these questions beforehand, I can assure you he doesn't and that I'm so glad he's answering these because that would go straight over my head. <laughs> so it was like a full-blown sermon. That was amazing. So the next question we have is, it's a hard one. Okay. So Mark, if there's no sermon today, will there at least be a map? Oh, that's a great question. I'll ask our tech team, if they put up a map, I'll explain it to you. So I'll, I'll tell you that they've got like 40,000 in the archives from my former <laughs> sermon, so maybe they'll pull one up later. All right, so a more serious question is, how does a Christian worldview align with the science of evolution? Okay, great question. Ooh. How does the Christian worldview align with the science of evolution? I think I need to start this question by saying Christians disagree on the question of evolution. Legitimate, godly, biblical Christians disagree. People on our church staff team disagree. People on our elder team disagree about this, and there are multiple views that you can have that would be legitimate biblical views uh, for this. And I'm respectful of all the people who have all the different kinds of evolutionary views, but I do have my view, and I do have the microphone, so I get to talk a little bit more uh, than the other people. Uh, one of the views is, so view A is that God created, well, let me, let me say this first. Here's a place that we all agree with one another. Evolution has a couple of ways of thinking about it. There's evolution as a philosophy and evolution as a process. So evolution as a process essentially says that God used time to be able to change animals and plants and other beings over a long period of time. Evolution as a process is potentially biblical, that that's something that God could have done. It's within his power, it's within his scope, it's within a biblical framework. Evolution as a philosophy says there was no God who was behind evolution. So it says it's just random processes and natural selection that made this happen. In essence, that beings aren't created, they're just slime that got lucky. Now this is against what the Bible has to say. You can't say that evolution happened without God. But there's three different ways that Christians think about how evolution happened that could be all plausible. View number one is generally people who are young earth creationists. And they say when God created everything six to 10,000 years ago, God created all of the animals and all of the biodiversity and it never became more diverse over time. Species may have died off, but no species have come into existence since the day of creation. Now, is it within God's power to create every species at the same moment with a snap of his fingers? Absolutely. God could have done it that way. So view number two is a view that God created the universe a long, long time ago, 13.7 or 9 billion years ago, the earth 4.7 billion years ago, and that God has used processes over time to be able to create uh, human beings and animals and plants and everything that's out there, 
but that he has interjected himself at certain points in the equation in order to be able to make that possible. So animals and human beings and everything have developed and changed over time. It would be an, evolu it would be an evolutionary view that would be pro-evolution as a process, but with God's power that's behind it all. Now, this is a sensible uh, process both for the Bible and for science. In the scientific arena, when you take a look at the fossil record, you'll see something that scientists call punctuated equilibrium. What that means is, as you look through the fossil record, it looks like there are long periods of stasis and then massive change. Long periods of stasis and then massive change. Long periods of stasis and then massive change. Typical evolutionary theory says everything changes slowly over time. You guys ever heard that before? Like it just little teeny steps all the time. The fossil record doesn't indicate that. The fossil record indicates it all stays the same and then bang, it all changes. Well, the second view says God's the reason behind that change. And that there are certain times where he intervenes supernaturally in order to create new species or grow eyes or grow organs or change things dramatically within a species. From a scientific perspective, we have oodles of evidence that microevolution happened. Like you guys see the peppered moth experiment when you were in high school, you know that one? Peppered moth experiment was done in the uh, Industrial Revolution, and there were these black and white peppered moths, and they would be on white branches of trees, and they would tend to be white because if they were black, they got eaten. Industrial Revolution happened, smoke got all over the trees, branches turned black, and what do you know? The ones that were blacker were the ones that survived, the ones that were white got eaten. Well, this is an example of microevolution, that within a species, without the species actually changing, certain characteristics become dominant based on uh, your environment. Microevolution is just a fact. It's just very hard to argue with. But what we don't have scientific uh, evidence for is macroevolution, like I didn't have a liver, but now I do. <laughs> I, I wasn't able to see, but now I can see. Those evolutionary pieces we've just never observed and we can't see them happening. What we see from the fossil record is that things stay the same, stay the same, stay the same. Boom, they change dramatically. What makes sense to me from a theological perspective is that God intervened in those moments and he was able to take creation to a brand new level. He's done it over a long, long time. Third view uh, that is uh, in this, and I'm in the second view, just so you guys know, that's my view. The third view is another evolutionary view that says, from the beginning of time, God created everything with all of the processes, all of the tools, all of the pieces and thoughts and ideas about DNA and how things would change. He put it all in play, and then he's allowing that to play out. And the genius of God happened at the moment of creation 13.7 billion years ago, much like a young earther would say the genius of God happened 10,000 years ago, only it's a longer time frame with more time for stuff to play out. It happened out, it played out naturally, but God supernaturally put all the pieces in place so that those kinds of things would move towards order. I don't hold this position, but one of my good friends, Perry Marshall, wrote a book called Evolution 2.0 that espouses this view, and it's a really helpful, brilliant book uh, that's from this perspective, and I would commend uh, a good read of that book. Now, while we're on this subject, I'm just going to do a quick uh, excursus on uh, Genesis 1 through 11. I talked about this in our origin series, but some people say we can confidently date the earth by looking at Genesis chapter 1 through 11. Particularly the folks who are in the young earth camp, say six to 10,000 years, you just add up all of, the, uh, uh, all of the genealogies, and you go back 2,000 years to Abraham, you trace it back, you'll get six to 10,000 uh, years old, the, the planet is. But I think it is a classic mistake of Bible study to try and ask questions of the Bible that the text is not trying to answer. Here's what I mean by this. In Genesis chapter 1 through 11, it is a worldview document about origins. It's about God. It's about uh, theology. It's about anthropology. It's about why are things the way they are? Where did we come from? But it is not a scientific textbook. So oftentimes, we ask of the Bible, can you be a scientific textbook for me? 
Because now, 3,000 years after that book was written, I'm asking different questions. Can you please answer the questions I'm asking now, 3,000 years later and 3,000 miles from there, that 99% of humanity has never asked, but I'm asking them now, can you answer those questions? And the answer is, that's not what Moses or God ever intended for Genesis chapter 1 through 11 to answer. So when we're asking questions, scientific questions, what's the age of the earth, how did uh, evolution take place, Genesis 1 through 11 was never intended to answer that. It was intended to answer uh, who started it all, God. When was it started? In the beginning. Is history linear or cyclical? It's linear because there was a beginning and things moved forward. Uh, What was behind the order of everything? God was. What's the nature of a human being? We're here to co-rule with God over creation, etc. Those questions are answered because those are the questions that Moses' audience was asking. So, Long answer to the evolutionary question, but three different views that Christians legitimately have. I would be in the middle one. I think biblically you can justify all three. Scientifically, the middle one makes the most sense to me. Whew. That was nine minutes, I think, so long one. Aren't y'all glad to have such a knowledgeable lead minister? (laughs) So... We're going to be taking a little bit of transition away from a more, um, from a theory to more of a personal circumstance. Um, so the question is, is it okay to refuse to take cancer treatment to allow nature to take its course so that we can be with Jesus? <clears throat> you know, uh, it, it's a deep question, and I know that this is intensely personal for people and a very emotional question, so I'm being a little bit more tender with this one because I know that it's, it's tender in a lot of people's lives. So I think the answer is yes, uh, that there are situations where it's okay to not receive a treatment in order to have a quality of life, maybe for a shorter amount of time, uh, and eventually go and be with Jesus. I think that people who, are, uh, who have cancer themselves have very difficult decisions to make. Sometimes there's intense pain. Sometimes the treatment winds up being such an awful quality of life that it's like I could live six months longer, but it's not really living for me. And it's moral. It's a moral choice that somebody can make to say, I'm just going to allow the disease to take its course and go down that natural path without fighting it. Uh, I think that's a decision that can be made. I think it's very difficult for me from the stage to say when is it right and when is it wrong. There are personal factors and medical factors that go into that that are very complicated that shouldn't be answered from this perspective but should be answered with a family, a doctor, somebody who's more personally involved, maybe a wise spiritual person who would help you but who would know the circumstances a lot better. But I think that there are some cases at least where it's okay to refuse treatment and uh, be able to allow nature to take its course and go to be with Jesus. One of the things that's helpful to just note, just to think about this, is A, we are not afraid of death as Christians. Death is not the end. It's not the thing that we're fighting against for, uh, uh, with every fiber of our being. Death is a doorway to go and be with Jesus. So we see death very uh, differently uh, than other people. And this life is just a breath. I mean, it's just a wisp of smoke. It's just a mist, as James says, that's going to go away anyway. And so the amount of time we have on earth, you know, whether it's 78 years or 79 years, is still just a wisp of smoke compared to eternity that God has for us. And as Christians, we keep those things in mind as we make these kinds of decisions. Yeah. So this next question is one that I have never even thought about. So great, great job whoever came up with this question. <laughs> um, why didn't Jesus write in the Bible while he was alive instead of having other people write about him? It's a really good question. It's a really, really good question. Uh, so I think there's an answer, but I don't know if this is God's answer. This is like Mark's speculation about why God might have done this. This is something that it doesn't say. In fact, whenever a question starts with, why didn't God do this? My answer starts with, I don't know why God didn't do this. Because I don't know why God made the choices he made, and I don't know all the pros and cons. But here's a maybe answer to this question. I think that whenever there is a holy person that writes a book, and they have the direct quotes from that person, the book tends to get elevated to the place of worship. Now, this is true, like, for example, in Islam. 
Uh, Muhammad wrote their book, the Quran, and in Islam, Muhammad is not the holiest thing. The Quran is the holiest thing because it's the direct words of God. In Christianity, it's the opposite. Jesus is the holiest thing, and the Bible points us towards Jesus. Does that make sense why that's upside down? Now, I speculate that if we had a book that was written by Jesus, we would begin to venerate the book over Jesus And the danger is that we start worshiping the book rather than worshiping God. Uh, By the fact that we have historians, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Paul, uh, who were eyewitnesses or who interviewed eyewitnesses and wrote down the facts about Jesus, the book then points us to Jesus and our worship points to Jesus rather than the book becoming elevated as the very, you know, written down word for word by Jesus uh, kind of words. We believe that the Bible is the authoritative word of God But we'll talk about some subtleties about what we mean by that in the B-I-B-L-E series that we're going to be doing right after our mission series. And that's a plug for you to come back for more on that one. One of my favorite things about Mark as our lead minister is the fact that he's unafraid to say, I don't know. And I think that's super important, especially in our context when people are asking us questions to say, I don't know, but I'll look into it. So I love that he has that humility. Um, It's a skill. It's a skill I've developed. I don't know. I don't know. know. Um, All right, so this is going back to the Old Testament, Mark. Um, This person says, I struggle with the many examples of God's wrath throughout the Old Testament. One example is when he struck down the priests or guards when they stopped the Ark of the Covenant from toppling when on a trek. Can you explain this? Okay, yeah, let me tell the story for those who may not know the story. The Ark of the Covenant had been taken over by the Philistines. Uh, It was in Philistine territory, and it had not yet yet been brought back to Jerusalem. So some priests went to go and bring the Ark of the Covenant back. Now, in the Old Testament, in the book of, I think it's Exodus, there were very specific commands about how the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be carried. It had these ringlets on either side that had bronze poles that would be placed into them, and you would have priests on all four sides carrying the bronze pole in order to make sure that the holiness of the, co- of the Ark of the Covenant was maintained by being surrounded by priests, and also if there was any like you know false footing that happened, it wouldn't get tipped over. Well, what they decided to do instead of doing what the Bible said about it was they decided to put it on a cart. And of course, on a cart with the wheels going back and forth, it could get jostled all over the place. So Uzziah, I think it was Uzziah, Uzzah, Uzziah, Uzzah, someone help me, Bible person, Bible person, Uzzah. Okay, so Uzzah is, uh, Uzziah was a king, yeah, Uzzah was the priest. He's walking alongside of it and all of a sudden the cart gets tippy, okay, so they're disobeying God. The Ark of the Covenant represents the holiness of God. A guy who knows better is standing right next to the Ark of the Covenant, disobeying God. He puts up his hand and bang, he gets zapped by the Ark of the Covenant. Now you go, that sounds harsh. But here's a guy who knows he's in the very presence of God. He has all of the laws and he's disobeying God like right to his face while the presence of God is right next to him. This was not just for Uzzah, it, it was for Uzzah, and I'm convinced that Uzzah probably went to heaven and you know, he got zapped and said, ooh, that was a bad choice. Uh, and his life was a little bit shorter than it, than it would have been, but you know, again, our life is just a wisp. But for the rest of the Israelite community, this was a very big deal. It taught them a huge lesson, and that is don't mess with the holiness of God. When the holiness of God is in your presence, you don't disobey him. You don't obey halfway. You don't do stupid things that you know God doesn't want you to do. God's holiness should not be trifled with. So they stopped the procession at that point and they said, okay, let's do things right. And from that point forward, they said, we're not only gonna carry it by the bronze poles, but we're gonna offer a sacrifice to God. Take seven steps. Offer another sacrifice to God. Take seven steps. So let me ask you this. Once they did that, do you think this molded their theology about the holiness of God? You better believe it did. It impacted the whole community. And when they brought that back and put it back in what was for a while the tabernacle, a tent, uh, do you think they treated that with the holiness of God? You better believe they did. 
So sometimes God will use the example of a single person in order to transform a whole community. And this was the idea uh, with Uzzah in this particular example. And uh, I'm convinced that for Uzzah, you know, it was a bad oops moment that didn't make a difference in uh, eternity. But for everybody else, it changed their culture and drew them closer to God and made them stand in awe of God and not do things in a way that was trivial. I've asked that question before in my life as well, and for those who are struggling with other questions with the Old Testament or just the Bible, uh, this is the oldest, most complex, different context and culture book ever written. <laughs> and so your questions are good and they're welcome, and keep asking questions because there's an opportunity to engage with God more, so keep asking those hard questions. Okay, so this is away from the Bible and more towards current culture um, with our world. How should Christian educators who do feel called to teach in this secular school respond to the way the public school system is going, specifically with LGBTQA plus students and with controversial curriculum? Yeah, so uh, great question. First of all, let me say kudos to our teachers and principals and people that decide to engage in the public school system. We love you, we love you. And I wanna say we need you in the public school system. You know, when, when there are students who are getting education degrees and saying I'm headed to the public schools, I'm like, yes, we need you to be engaging in that arena. Because if we abdicate in that arena, all of a sudden it just goes down a secular pathway that doesn't under, honor God and it molds the next generation to uh, walk away from the principles of truth and the things that are there of God. And we see the implications of that happening in our culture uh, with a lot of things that are spinning out of control morally, violence on the rise, all kinds of things that come from uh, embedding in our kids a secular worldview from the time that they are uh, very young. Amen. And sexuality is one of those things. LGBTQ issues is one of those things that the school system is teaching overtly things that are very different than what you would find in the Bible. Now, I would say we have to have Christians in that environment, and we have to be people who speak our, con speak our conscience in that matter. In fact, I would guess, and I haven't done statistics on this, but I would guess that a large percentage of parents in the school system would rather have their kids be taught conservative morals when it comes to sexual things than liberal morals. And it's actually a minority of people that are driving what's being taught to our young people in order to mold the opinions of the next generation as they come up. They'll be less resistant as it happens in the future. So schools are not representing what parents would like their kids to be taught very well when they take them down a lot of these uh, different liberal uh, angles. What and so, what, what he said. What he thank you, Kim, thank you. Appreciate the affirmation. Uh, <laughs> but I lost my train of thought because of it. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I, if, you're, if you're a teacher, I would say you need to be full of the spirit, full of savvy, full of wisdom. You need to be on the committees that help make decisions. You need to speak your mind. You need to love people well. You need to be an example of Christ-likeness. And in that context, you can be a voice of influence in the public schools, and we need you to be that voice of influence. So we're cheering for you, we're praying for you. Keep up the good work. What he said. All right, Mark, this is our second to last question. Okay. How do you honor your father and mother if they don't want you to follow God? Or they are living a lifestyle you don't agree with. And we've talked about this before. Maybe you've, a parent has a different, um, you have a different relationship or difficult relationship with a parent. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, how do you honor your, your mother and father? And some of this depends on whether you're still in the home with your mother and father or you've moved out already. So I'll say if you're an adult child, you do need to honor your mother and father for a lifetime, but you do not need to obey your mother and father for a lifetime. Does that make sense? So there will be things that your parents say, hey, this is my advice, this is the direction you should be on. Once you're outside of your parents' house, not just physically, but economically, those ties get broken and you really have to be responsible for making your own decisions for yourself. Lean into your parents for wisdom, but if they're telling you to do things that are ungodly, unethical, unbiblical, then you do not, uh, you're not bound to honor them by obeying them. If you're a kid who's still in the home, you are still bound by your parents' rules while you live in their household, and you need to have a lot of savvy of how do I uh, honor my parents, 
uh, in the midst of this if they're more permissive than I am. Now, I find that most parents uh, who are unbiblical parents, who say, I I would affirm a lifestyle that's different than what you're choosing as a Christian, are more permissive, but they don't force you to do things that are immoral while you're in their house. It's a very rare parent that would ask you to do those things. So usually you have the choice to be able to say, you know what, Uh, you know, thanks that you give me permission and freedom to do those things, I'm just not going to choose to do them. And while you live in your parents' house, that's just great. Once you're outside of your parents' house, you need to honor your parents, speak well of them, you know, uh, uh, keep a relationship with them, show up from time to time, but you do not need to obey them uh, anymore after that point. Did I answer it well? All right, good. All right, Mark. This is our last question. Last question, all right. All right, buckle Doesn't in. this time go by really fast? Like, it really does. Okay. Okay, many verses say, um, believe and be baptized. Is baptism required for salvation? Is there a verse that clearly states that it is or is not? Okay, yeah, so one of the verses I would look at would be Acts 2.38, Acts 2.38, so this is Pentecost Day. Peter's just preached the sermon, and in Acts 2.38, 2.37, people say, what should we do? You know, we want to believe in Jesus, and Peter says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Now, this is the verse that's the most controversial when this subject comes up. And the people who are pro-baptism for salvation say, look, repentance and baptism are the two requirements in order to be saved and to receive the Holy Spirit. If you haven't repented, if you haven't been baptized, then uh, too bad, uh, you don't have the Holy Spirit and you're not saved. Uh, This is not the teaching of Christ Community Church, but that is the verse uh, that that idea would come from. And there are some verses, there's some other verses that will tie repentance and baptism kind of in the same language. The way we would see it at Christ's community is that uh, repent means, I'm just going to get in front of you, I'm not going to get in front of you, turn from your old ways and turn towards Jesus. It's basically saying forsake whatever your old gods were, forsake whatever things were in your past, and instead turn towards Jesus. You have to do that in order to be saved. You have to turn to Jesus. That's kind of the definition of what our role is in making salvation happen. Baptism would be like, okay, Turn from your old things and prove it by being baptized. Go public with your faith. The forgiveness of sins is tied to the repentance in this sentence, but the baptism is the evidence that that faith is real. The Bible's really clear in saying that we're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one will boast. That's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So baptism is a work that is not required for salvation. What is baptism? Baptism is the external evidence of an internal decision. It's a public statement of something that we've done privately. It's a lot like what a wedding ring is uh, to a marriage. A wedding ring doesn't make you married, but it symbolizes that you are married, and it's a public declaration, hey, hands off, I already got me a wife, okay? Baptism is the same kind of a symbol. It doesn't get you saved. Instead, it demonstrates that you are, in fact, saved. The other thing that you have to look at is that there's not just one verse in the Bible. There's a whole load of verses in the Bible that tell us about salvation. So, for example, John 3.18 says, Whoever believes is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in God's one and only Son. What's the difference between who's saved and who's not saved? It's believed, if you've believed or not believed. And over and over in the Bible, there are verses that talk about salvation is based on your belief, whether you believe or don't believe. And this is really the crux of the Christian message. It's the idea that we can't do anything. We can't do anything to earn our salvation. Have you guys ever thought of that? It is not by works. It's not by baptism. It's not by being moral enough. It's not by going to church enough. It's not by giving enough money away. It's not by watching enough YouTube videos. It's not about being nice to the poor, being a good parent. None of that stuff gets you saved. There's only one thing that gets you saved, and that's Jesus. His death on the cross is what buys our salvation. Our problem is not a works problem where we haven't racked up enough good things. Our problem is a sin problem where we've done so many terrible things that have isolated us from God, 
offended other people, hurt the creation that God has created. And the problem we have to ask is, what are we going to do with the deficit? What are we going to do with our sin problem? So Jesus came to planet Earth once and for all to say, I will take care of your sin problem for you. In fact, it's a high cost to pay for your sins. It's the cost of the blood of God's one and only son. And because of that, we can walk away scot-free because Jesus says, I've paid it all. We are, didn't we sing that today? Jesus paid it all? It was, okay, I was trying to think. Was that today? Yeah, Jesus paid it all. Uh, sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. So it's by our belief in him and our trust in him that we, in fact, are saved. All that, right, what... Mark. So we got a really hard question this morning to start off. Because So it says, if there's no sermon this morning, will there at least be a map for this morning? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, well, I don't have a map plan, but our tech team has like 4,300 maps on file that I've used in the past. So if they throw it up on the back screen, I will be glad to explain what that map is all about. But I don't, I don't have one. He handled that beautifully, didn't he? That was a really tough question. Tough question, thank you, yeah. All right, so our first question relates to our deliverance ministry. So if you guys aren't familiar, we had a series called Even the Demons a while ago, and so we had a lot with that. So it says, how is CCC's deliverance ministry going? How has it helped people, both those receiving and walking people through deliverance? Ballpark number of how many people have been helped? Okay, great question. So if you've been here a couple years, I'll give you kind of a two-year perspective on this. Uh, two years ago, we really had no deliverance ministry going on. When we say deliverance ministry, what do we mean? We mean casting demons out of people or off of people. When people come in, they're demonized, and we help them to walk away without demons. And uh, this may sound a little bit weird, particularly if you're not from a very church culture or you don't read the Bible very much, but we believe that the spiritual world is very real. And that Satan loves to hassle us, harass us, get in our heads, lie to us, and change our lives to drag us away from God. And sometimes there are people who get, or demons get particularly attached to a person. They become demonized. And that it's part of the kingdom of God that we bring hope and truth and healing and power and freedom from demons. Now... Two years ago, we had no ministry related to this. In fact, it kind of made me nervous, if, if I'm quite honest. Uh, but a couple of years ago, God started doing a fresh work in our church. We said, okay, if this is what the Bible teaches, if the Bible says that Jesus came in order to bring freedom and healing and casting out demons and we should do the same thing, then we should just learn and start to get good at this thing we haven't done very much in the past. And so we did a series called Even the Demons. Uh, we have a mentor from our seminary by the name of Rod Reamer, Rob Reamer, who came out and he's done a great job of teaching us and coaching us in that. And out of a soul care conference that we had last February, a team of people have been learning and practicing, okay, how do we do this aspect of ministry? And I'll just say from my perspective, I am just very excited about the way that it's turning out and how people are becoming free. Most of this happens behind the scenes because it's not appropriate for public consumption. And we haven't told a lot of stories about these things because of the, you can imagine, the personal nature behind it. But I would say every week people are coming and being delivered uh, from demons. Every week. Uh, we've got a team that meets on Tuesday nights and then they do other deliverances during other times. Uh, they're always available in the prayer room over here for salvation or healing or you know, uh, sickness or deliverance on Sunday mornings, and they would be available for you. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if we have, I should ask Wendell about this, but I'd say eight appointments a week of people who are uh, experiencing freedom in Jesus through his power through this. So that would be a couple hundred people uh, for sure in the last year. And uh, it's very exciting. It's very exciting. Uh, I believe in all kinds of different tools that help people with mental illness and spiritual illness and physical illness, and this is just one more tool in our toolkit that we're learning. I would say, you know, last year we're freshmen, this year we're kind of sophomores. We're not really, really good at it at this point, but we're getting better and we're learning, and I think over time it's going to help an awful lot of people to experience freedom in Jesus. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's a cool thing. 
Yeah, uh, they have an amazing team. I've actually received deliverance from people on that team, and it is fantastic. So feel free to come ask me about my experience, too. That's something that's still um, a little bit uh, strange for you and your background with Christianity. So we're going to move away from more of a theological into a more personal question, Mark. Yeah. Um, how are we to forgive like Christ when a relative has been and is still abusive? And this could relate to the 9 a.m. service, how you honor your father or your mother if that's the relative that may be abusing you. Okay, yeah, how do you, uh, what was the first part of it? How do you, what yeah. was your parents? Um, how are we to forgive like Christ forgive when parents. a relative has been and is still abusive? Okay, so let me talk a little bit about what forgiveness means on the front side because I think that there's a cultural understanding of forgiveness that's not the same as the biblical understanding. Oftentimes when you hear forgiveness, you hear a phrase that goes with it. You guys can fill in the blank. Forgive and... Okay, not only is this not biblical, I don't think it's possible, and oftentimes it's not smart, okay? Forgive and forget. If you're in an abusive situation, it's just downright dumb to forget that there's an abuser that's out there, particularly if you are in the same household or under the authority of that person that is the abuser, what forgiveness means biblically is to release the bitterness that you're holding against somebody. Forgiveness is something that is 100% in your power to be able to say, I'm going to release the anger and the bitterness and the poison that's inside of my soul that's geared towards that person. And I just want to say as a side note, the other person does not have to say I'm sorry or repent or change for this to be able to happen. If you say, I'm not going to forgive somebody unless they apologize to me, who has the power on whether or not you forgive? It's the other person. And you do not want to give the other person the power about bitterness. Bitterness is something that you think you're holding against the other person, but who does it poison? It poisons you. It poisons your own soul. So when Jesus says forgive, he's talking about releasing the bitterness, the anger, the need for revenge that there is against that person. And anybody can forgive. Now, the next question related to that is, okay, if I forgive a person, does that necessarily mean that I should reconcile with that person? And the answer is usually, but not always. Usually, but not always. Most of the time when you're forgiving somebody, you forgive them of the wrong that was against you and you can continue to be in relationship with them and keep moving on. In fact, I would say for most relationships, most of the time, forgiveness is required for you to keep on moving forward in that relationship. But when you're talking about a perpetually abusive relationship, reconciliation is oftentimes not wise for you to go to. To continue to go back to that person, to continue to be under that person's authority is uh, uh, something that's just not wise. And when it's a family member, sometimes cutting off that relationship is the right thing to do morally. Uh, because if you say my choices are to cut myself off or remain in an abusive relationship, cutting off or just setting up appropriate boundaries with that person is a healthy thing to do. Sometimes it doesn't mean you cut them off totally, but it means you limit the amount of time that you talk to them, that you're subject to them, that you visit them, or the context within which that happens, or if there's you know long visits or overnight visits or those types of things, is sometimes just the wise thing to do. So you can forgive them and establish boundaries. You can forgive them and even say, my boundaries are that I'm not going to relate to that person anymore because forgiveness is about your internal world and your attitude towards that person and not about the way that the relationship continues on. And now Jesus says that we always should not have revenge towards that person. Revenge is God's. And so forgiveness or uh, non-forgiveness never relates to revenge. But forgiveness is always about what happens in your inner world as you release the bitterness towards the other person. So how do you do that? Oftentimes that forgiveness is a process. Forgiveness can be a challenging thing. My favorite book on this is called Forgive and Forget by Lou Smeads, ironically. Uh, Lou Smeads is a professor, and kind of one of his premises in the book is that forgive and forget is oftentimes impossible or ridiculous, and so uh, that's partly why I like the book. Uh, but it's a great book on working through the process of for forgiveness in your own soul, and if that's something that you're working on, I would highly recommend it. There's actually, I think, three books by Lou Smeads on this, L-E-W-S-M-E-D-E-S, uh, one of them is The Art of Forgiving, and I forget the third title, but they're all great, and he's, he's kind of my go-to guy on the forgiveness question. 
All right, next question is, I'm wondering if it's biblical to sell shirts or hats or et cetera in the atrium because Jesus was angry when the people at the church were selling stuff. It's a great question. Jed's in charge of that. Jed, where are you? Jed, can you, can you help me with that? No, that, that really is a good question. You know, what had happened in Jesus' day was uh, the, the temple courtyards were designed to be a place that was a house of prayer. Uh, my house shall be a house of prayer. I think that's in Isaiah 56 or somewhere in there. Uh, and Jesus came in, and what he found was that during the Passover celebration, things had become so overwhelmingly marketed that in the temple courtyards, which there were multiple temple courtyards, courtyard for the Gentiles, for the Jews, including the women, for the Jews, men only, and then for the priests. And in the outer courtyard, the one that was the, the courtyard for the Gentiles, they had set up all kinds of booths. Money changers for people who are coming far away, selling sheep for sacrifices, and selling other things. What did that do? Well, it made it so that those who were supposed to be there, Gentiles from every nation to worship God, didn't have space to do it. So not only was it a transformation of the location from prayer to marketing, it was also a racist act towards people who were non-Jews in that the Jews still had their places to come to worship, but the Gentiles did not. And Jesus said, my father has said, this will be a house of prayer for many nations, not just for the Jewish people to have a marketing quarter and then their section inside, but everybody in the world is supposed to be welcome at this place. The problem wasn't so much that there was trade that was happening there. The problem was that the trade had supplanted uh, the worship of God. It had crowded out the ability for people to pray and to welcome new people. In, in a church where you say, hey, we've got some things that we have for sale in the atrium, we should ask the question, is this making it impossible for people to pray? Is it taking up our spaces that were designed for prayer? Is it keeping people away who otherwise would be welcome at church? And none of those things are happening, so I wouldn't apply that verse to what's happening in the atrium. Nice. Aren't you guys glad Jed we have such a knowledgeable guy for oh, our thanks, lead thanks. minister? <laughs> I just think Jed's feeling really good wherever he is right now that he didn't have to do that one. There are for sure, I've heard some skeptics of Mark knowing these questions beforehand. Um, I'm getting these questions as they come in, so Mark doesn't know them. So we are super blessed to have a guy who knows so much about so much. And the college ministry is very blessed and to be here, And the college ministry yeah. is amazing, mm -hmm. yes. All right, so next question is, can God's will override our will for our lives? Do we have a cho choice? And it says, example, Jonah Example, Jonah, an excellent example, I would say. <laughs> yeah, so can God's will override our will for our lives? The very simple, easy answer is, duh. You know, God's all-powerful and in charge of everything. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and he can force us to do things in all different kinds of ways. Uh, Bruce Almighty is a very interesting movie <laughs> in... Uh, in the way that God kind of pushes Bruce Almighty to do these things in a particular direction. Now, it's a comical version. There's some bad theology in there, but that part is very, very fascinating and interesting and, uh, and likable. Jonah's another great thing. Like, Jonah goes that way. God wants him to go that way. I'll send a storm and a fish, and I'll vomit you out until you go the right direction. So God has very interesting ways of weaving our lives together. And I think sometimes God is subtly weaving our lives together with little prompts and pokes and things that get us in the right place at the right time. We may not even find out about until eternity. If God wants to impose his will on us, he certainly can. Now, I think most of the time, God gives us a broad freedom of choice. That what we choose, he gives us a free will, he gives us his spirit, he gives us a mind to think about things, and most of the time, most of our choices are not dictated by what we have to do. God gives us the freedom to do, do those things. But the question is, can God's will over, override our will for our lives? 100%. God can do whatever he wants whenever he wants. All right. Does sinning cause unrelated bad things to happen in a person's life, the person that sinned? Or is that just superstition? superstition? Yeah, uh, so the, I'm gonna answer the question directly and then I'm gonna answer what I think is behind the question. 
So the answer directly, does sinning cause unrelated bad things to happen in that person's life, is yes. It absolutely does. When you sin, it changes the way that you think. It changes your priorities. It changes your internal world. Every time you give yourself over towards sin, there's new pathways that are created. There's new compromises. It makes the next compromise easier. It affects your internal world. It affects your relationships. It affects your external world. Like sin affects everything. So you say, does it cause unrelated bad things to happen in that person's life? Absolutely, it does. And it, maybe that's related bad things to happen in that person's life primarily. I think what this person is asking, though, is they say, uh, is it the case that because, you know, I lied to my mom that God is punishing me and I lost my job? You know, they're totally unrelated kinds of things. Bad things happen to me because I sinned uh, over in this arena. And generally, I think that more fits in the superstition category. That that's not God's way of working with us, of saying, okay, I'm going to squash you because you sinned. Now, God does want to reform us with our sins. He wants to empower us so that we won't continue to sin anymore. And he oftentimes allows consequences of our sins to take place in our lives as a way of teaching us, don't do that. You know, don't keep going in that direction because sin is destructive. And if God kept us from the consequences of sin, well, then, like, we would never learn our lesson and change our ways. And so sometimes God allows the consequences to happen, but I don't see God cosmically in the sky saying, because they sinned in this area, I'm going to wreck their lives in that area over there. That's just not the way that God does it. God is a kind and gracious God, and he wants to use our lives and our circumstances to guide us towards repentance so that we can have full life in him, so we can live the kind of life that he designed us for. But he's not a punitive God. He's a God who loves to be able to uh, mold us, kind of like a good, healthy parent loves to mold you. God loves to mold you as well to help you to make good choices that are going to be life-giving and fulfilling for you and uh, not punitive and harsh. All right, Mark, you're going to love this next question because it relates to evangelism. So, uh, How do I share the gospel with, quote-unquote, West Omaha people who are so successful that they don't see a need for God. They have no reason to rely on God. They see the testimonies of drug addicts, et cetera, that aren't to them, and they can't relate to it. That's a great question. I think if that's the case for you, you should take the Reach One More training with Mary Claire Johnson, uh, maybe even with the college ministry. I would Uh, love to teach Reach One More with the college ministry. (laughs) Uh, And that'll train you about how to share your faith in a general sense. Uh, But let me give you the quick answer. One is, everybody has a need for God whether they express it or not. So when I think about the people who live in my neighborhood, whenever I get to know them, their lives look pretty good, you know, as they're pulling in, you know, putting up their garage door, they pull their car in, and uh, I don't see them anymore except for waving for them. Their lives look pretty well put together. But when you get deep into somebody's life, you realize that there is, everybody has their share of pain and dysfunction and needs and other problems that are going on in their life. And if they don't have those things now, they will have them in the next couple of years. Because that's just the way that life works. Now when you're talking about somebody who's more affluent, which I think is uh, what this question is about, somebody who's more affluent and seems like they don't have all of the obvious needs out there, the needs that they have are still very real needs. Everybody needs a connection with God. Everybody needs community. Everybody needs forgiveness of sins. Everybody needs hope for their future. Everybody needs moral values and guidance for the way to live their life. And it doesn't matter how affluent or non-affluent you are, you need all of those things. As we live our lives with Jesus living through us, whether someone is high or low on the economic spectrum, they should see the power of God living through us in a way that has qualities that transcend affluence and go deep into what our character is like, what our relationships are like, what our love level is like. And even if somebody says, you know what, right now my life is fine, I don't need God in my life, you can stay in proximity to them and as time goes by, questions will arise. Because we're human beings and we're asking those fundamental questions of where did I come from? Where am I going? What does it mean to be human? What are relationships like? And as we ask those questions, 
we go deeper and deeper in life, and then you wanna ask those questions of people who seem like they've got some answers that they've put together. And as we're in proximity with people, high affluence or low affluence, the power of God can be at work for, within us, and then we listen to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives us ideas for how do we ask questions, how do we go deeper in conversations, how do we find out what people's felt needs are, and at that point, we have opportunity to introduce theological principles that will help a person to take their next step spiritually. All right, Mark, I don't have a question for you, but we do have a surprise. So if you could please put the map up, up on the screen, that'd be amazing. And if you could please explain this map to us, that would be amazing. I can explain this map. Now, this is a map of the exile. Somebody say exile. Exile. The year is either 606 or 586 BC, depending on which one there is. There were actually two groups of people that went from Jerusalem to Babylon for the exile. The exile's talked about probably most predominantly in the book of Daniel, but Ezekiel is a book that actually happened in Babylon during the exile, and so a lot of Ezekiel was written by the river Kibar, uh, which is over here uh, near uh, the river Euphrates that they're on at this point. And when the Babylonian army came in, in 586 BC, they took over this entire region all the way down to Jerusalem. Eventually they took over Jerusalem. There were a lot of prophets that were there that were telling them, be good, or the Babylonians are going to come in and smite you. Uh, They came in and smited them and exported the people from 586. Uh, The prophet Jeremiah said, you're going to be there for 70 years and then God's going to bring you back. And what do you know, in 516 BC, God brought them back. And they came back with uh, Zerubbabel and then Ezra and Nehemiah. They built the walls and then they lived in Jerusalem uh, under the rule of despotic authorities until Jesus came back again. There's your map. Who is this guy? (laughs) Thanks, dudes. We also, we kind of matched the map with our outfits. That was really fun. That is kind of cool. You know, Mary Claire and I, one of the things we share that's a little (laughs) bit weird uh, is wow colors. Wow colors. Wow colors. And uh, we both love the whole color me beautiful thing, (laughs) which is embarrassing for me to say as I say it right now in front of other people. Like, what colors make your skin tone look good? Don't these colors make my skin tones look great? And Mary Claire's as well. We're both both rocking it today. I just want you to know we're rocking our wow colors. We're glowing. All right. And the map matches. Yep. All right. Next question. (laughs) We'll shift tone a little bit more. Um, So why do you believe that some miracles are healed, some are prayed over for many years, and some the answer is no? Is there any other reason other than just God's wills it? Okay, so it was a question about healing. Yeah. And some, okay, some miracles are healed, it. some prayed over years, and sometimes the answer is no. Okay, yeah, so uh, this, is the, this is a question about praying for healing. This is a very emotional question, and I'm convinced that whenever we pray for healing, God's answer is always yes, but not always in our time frame. So I've prayed for hundreds of people for miraculous healing, and sometimes it happens on the spot. Uh, I got story after story of people who, wow, uh, they were, you know, at one point they had something really, really bad, and then they were miraculously healed. Uh, I think I could say uh, Dan McClan from our staff was miraculously healed this month uh, after going in for an elder prayer. Is that true? Yeah, Dan's right there. Can I say that out loud, Dan? Okay, it's on the internet now. He had a back thing. He's got CAT scans and MRIs and all that stuff to prove it, and uh, God did a miraculous healing in his life. So that was really cool. Uh, But that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you pray and God uses natural processes to heal you. He uses doctors, he uses medicines, he uses nutrition, he uses exercise, chiropractors, to be able to bring about healing in a natural way. God created those systems in in our world to be able to help us to get healed, and I think that if he doesn't heal us supernaturally, we're still wise to go to doctors and other smart people in order to be able to see healing that takes place in our life through natural means. And then if you're somebody who doesn't get healed, I mean, uh, this, I don't mean this to be glib, but there are times when I have prayed for people who are sick and then they died. And uh, when that happens, you go, oh boy, that's sad for us in this world. God didn't answer their prayers. No, not at all. God did answer our prayers for healing. He just heals us on the other side of death when he not only heals all of our infirmities, but he gives us brand new super bodies to be able to live with him forever and ever and ever. Amen. Our bodies are a reminder 
that this world is breaking down, that sin has its consequences, that everything is kind of moving towards the law of entropy. Everything is breaking down in this world, but that Jesus is going to renew all things one day, and our healing is sure even if it doesn't happen in the body. And God has very clear plans for us in our life. Sometimes it involves healing that's supernatural. Sometimes it involves healing that is long-term. Sometimes it involves staying in the pain and learning to work with God. And God walks with you through the pain until he takes you home one day. Amen. Yeah. I love questions like that. Um, I'll just add because... These kind of questions uh, we wrestle with as believers, and there's a lot of questions that we're not even asking that we wrestle with, and it's things that can shake our faith or things that can confuse us, because this is a very complex old book for us to understand. So keep asking your questions, because you will engage more with God in the middle of these questions. So keep asking them. We love to hear them. All right. Next question, Mark. Oh. Is saying the words for the abbreviation OMG in a careless way taking God's name in vain? So I think that some of you guys know in 2010, uh, I became ordained for ministry. And, uh, you know, so my official title is Ordained Minister of the Gospel, which is OMG. And uh, if you're using OMG that way, then it's totally fine. It is not taking God's name in vain. I want you to know that. No, uh, in general, you know, my uh, proclivity is to say Anything that is or sounds like or smacks of taking God's name in vain, I just wouldn't do it. I'd just avoid it. Uh, if you say OMG, people know that you're saying, oh my God, and that's invoking God's name as an explicative. And uh, it's, God's name is not meant to be that way. God's name is a holy name. And when we talk about Jesus, when we use the name of God, we should use it in a way that's holy. If we use it in a way, let's say that's not demeaning, but it's just kind of flip, it's glib, it's trivializing God's name. We never wanna be the people who are trivializing who God is, and so I would say, even if you're using abbreviations that mean something else, like OMG, I would just avoid the situation, treat God's name as holy, treat God with the honor that he deserves, and then that will keep him honored in our hearts as holy. So my answer would be, avoid that. Uh, that's something that I would not recommend. Cool. How should Christians think well about AI or artificial intelligence and other technologies like chat GPT? Whew, okay. Uh, this is an emerging question, and I think that this is going to be one of the most important moral questions that the next generation asks. Uh, I think we have to be incredibly thoughtful about this uh, as Christians. I think that there are some big advantages and some huge dangers to what's happening with, uh, with AI and ChatGPT. I've used it a number of times to be able to look something up. It's impressive what it's able to do. But there are also some incredible science fiction novels and doomsday scenarios about what happens when artificial intelligence becomes self-replicating and increases in power. I think there are very real dangers with replacing the intelligence of a human mind and morality with something that does not have a soul and does not have the same kind of a mind as we have. So I would just say be careful uh, about that as we head towards the future. I wish I had something more articulate to say, except that as I look at it personally, I would say very real dangers that are behind this. Uh, there are some technological gurus that are out there. Elon Musk is the most famous, who are signing some papers that are saying, before we move forward with next levels of AI, we should be very thoughtful with the boundaries that we put around it. Uh, I think it's gonna be one of our huge challenges of the next 20 years uh, as AI continues to grow rapidly, as knowledge continues to grow rapidly, and the moral questions we ask around that will be critical for the next generation. All right, so my friends have been asking me what denomination I am, but I can't exactly pinpoint what we are in this church, so I'm asking what we are. What are we? What are we anyway? <laughs> We're the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Thank you, Mary Claire, yes. We're the Christian Missionary Alliance. Uh, we try not to hide it. We're uh, in a post-denominational world. There's an awful lot of churches that are embarrassed of their denomination. That's just not the case with us. We love our denomination. We're very proud to be a part of it, the Christian Missionary Alliance. There's a few things that I'll tell you about it if it's something that's new to you. Uh, so we're 130. 
35, 140 years old, 135, whatever, 1887 uh, was the beginning of the Christian Missionary Alliance. And uh, we are, uh, I'm trying to calculate it in my mind while I talk, but I can't do that right now. Anyway, from 1887 until now, we've been committed to a few key things. One of the things that's a distinctive of us is that we're committed to taking the best news ever to the least reached people. From the very first time that the Christian Missionary Alliance was started, it was started as an organization who says, we don't just exist for ourselves, but we exist for the nations, and we particularly exist for people who have never heard about Jesus before. So we want to grow in our faith here, and we want to make sure that we're sending the best and and the brightest to places in the world that don't have access to the gospel, and we're going to send people to those arenas. Second thing that we're deeply committed to is called the deeper life or the deeper life of the Holy Spirit. That our job is not to just be more religious or more Bible savvy. We want to get to know God in a way that brings supernatural power into our lives. We really believe that Jesus can supernaturally transform a human soul that he can supernaturally heal people, that he can supernaturally cast out demons, that he can supernaturally guide our lives. And who in the world wants to just live a natural life when you have access to the supernatural, amen? Man, I wanna live with the supernatural. So we say we wanna pursue the deeper life of Jesus by teaching about the Holy Spirit, by practicing some of these things, by getting better at them, by learning how to listen to the Holy Spirit and walk with our lives. So those are the two distinctives of them true of the Christian Missionary Alliance from the beginning. One other thing that's kind of famous about the Christian Missionary Alliance is known as the fourfold gospel. So A.B. Simpson, who is our founder, said, look, a lot of churches teach the gospel in a single dimension. And the single dimension is that Jesus saves me from my sins, and if I trust in him, I'll go to heaven after I die. And my job in the meantime is just to get to know the Bible really well, and you know, if that happens, that's great. What Simpson said is there are more dimensions than one to the Christian story. That when Jesus comes into your life, yes, he does save you from your sins, but then he also is your sanctifier. What that means is he transforms you from the inside out to make you look more like Jesus. Third, he is your healer. He's the one who will take the broken stuff inside of you and make sense of it and heal it and make it new. And then the last thing is he's our coming king. So we look to our past and we have our forgiveness taken care of. We look to our future and we have hope in a coming king. And we look to our present and we find transformation and healing. So that's why I oftentimes end my prayers with Jesus, our Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, and Coming King, is because that embodies the idea of the fourfold gospel. Or out in our hallways, you might notice that we've got four paintings. We've got a savior, a sanctifier, a healer, and a coming king painting that's out there. And in our little symbol that's got the, uh, uh, the cup and the pitcher and the crown and the cross, uh, that symbolizes uh, Jesus as our savior, sanctifier, healer, and coming king. So those are a few things about our denomination, the Christian Missionary Alliance. We're super proud of our denomination. We are a big part of our denomination. We give generously to the Great Commission Fund that sends missionaries to the furthest parts of the earth, and we love getting the mission done with the people we love. Where are we going this May, Mark? Where are we going this yeah, May? Yeah, for Spokane. Spokane. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> In between now and Spokane, yeah. Uh, I'm going to Israel, twice to Minnesota, then Spokane. Yeah, so we'll be sending, I don't know, 30, 50 people to Spokane, Washington for our general council uh, to be a part of our broader family, vote on important things, and all that type of stuff. That's going to be happening in Spokane with a, a bunch of our staff and volunteers. Cool. Yep. All right, this is our very last question. Okay. <laughs> How is it that the most devout Jewish or Muslim person living their life for God um, will not go to heaven because they do not believe in Jesus? Okay, it's a great question. How, how is it that the most devout Jewish or Muslim person that doesn't believe in God will not go to heaven? Is that right? Mm-hmm. So it's interesting, when Jesus was around, he was talking to Jewish people, right? And he was talking to devout Jewish people. So this is not my idea, this is Jesus' idea. Jesus said to them things like in John chapter three, verse 18, whoever believes in me is not condemned. I'm sorry, yeah, whoever believes in me is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in God's one and only son. And at the time, we realized Jesus is talking to devout Jewish people at this time. 
What Jesus is saying to them is, through all of world history, all of these stories, all of these poems, all these pictures, all these prophecies have been leading up to me. And if you're somebody who truly believes the scriptures, I am the fulfillment of all of those things that you have been waiting for. So now at this point, everything that you believe is pointing to me, trust in me. Because the reality is, all of those things they've been doing up to this point are foreshadowing of what's going to happen with Jesus. So for example, if they sacrificed a lamb for the forgiveness of sins, it is symbolically effective, but is not ontologically effective. It's not really effective. It's, it doesn't create a real difference of the change of sins in their life. But if they place their faith in that, then up until Jesus came, Jesus' blood would be applied retroactively. If they place their faith in that after Jesus is here, then they're placing their faith in something that's false when what is true is right in front of them. Jesus says to Muslims and Jews and to everybody who's here in this world, I am here to set you free. I'm here to give you forgiveness of sins. I'm here to solve the biggest problem that you have. And the biggest problem that we have in this world is not that we haven't stacked up enough good deeds, it's not that we haven't been devout enough to some religion. Our big problem is we have a sin problem. We've rebelled against God. We've betrayed other people. We've hurt our own souls. We've hurt the planet. We've done this stack of things against God. What's going to happen to get rid of our sins? And there is no religion that gets rid of sins. Judaism doesn't. Christianity doesn't. Islam doesn't. Religion does not get rid of sins. Jesus gets rid of sins. And so we have to depend on Jesus to be the one who pays for our sins. It's not by going to synagogue or church or mosque or anything that gets you saved. It's Jesus and trusting in Jesus alone that gets you saved. Now, in particular, because they ask about Muslims, I'll go ahead and talk about this. Muslims teach very clearly in the Quran that Jesus was a prophet a good man, a miracle worker, and he's coming back to judge the living and the dead. Pretty interesting. But the Quran also teaches that Jesus did not die on the cross, that he is not the son of God, and that he did not rise from the dead. If you choose to reject those things, you have rejected God's idea of salvation. That's why it's impossible for a devout Muslim to be able to go to heaven. They can't, because they have to trust in Jesus, and that's against what the Quran teaches. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the one who died on the cross. Jesus is the one who rose from the dead. It's the only way to be able to get to heaven. So we have to point not to religion, not of any stripe, but to Jesus himself, trusting in him for our life, for our future resurrection that's going to take place as well. And uh, I think that's a great place to end our question and answer, is we got to trust in Jesus. In fact, I think we should pray uh, as we come out of this and invite you. If you want to trust in Jesus, I'll pray a prayer that lets you trust in Jesus. So let's stand up here together. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, if your question didn't get answered, uh, you can look in the question and answer archive, 122 questions in there. Some of them go back to like when I was 40 years old. So if you want to see a younger Mark, uh, those are in the archives as well. Uh, after the services on our uh, uh, YouTube channel, uh, CCC Omaha, we'll be uh, answering questions. And then keep watching this week, because we'll answer some of these questions from Israel as well. And uh, that should be an exciting way to take the whole family uh, with on the trip as we go from here. So let's pray together. Jesus, I'm so grateful that you have come in order to live a human life. I'm so grateful that you died on the cross. I'm so grateful that you rose from the dead. I believe those things are real and life-changing. And Father, I pray for everybody who's here in this room. If there's anybody who hasn't yet trusted in you, I pray that they would make today the day that they say, yes, yes, I wanna follow Jesus. Yes, I wanna believe in Jesus. I, I want my sins forgiven. I want my future assured. I wanna know that God lives inside my life and can transform me from the inside out. And God, I pray for them. I pray that they'll just say yes to you in this moment. I pray that they'll turn to their friend or whoever brought them or run to our Connect booth and say, I want to know more, and that they would be coached towards their next steps, uh, towards following you. Give them grace for that moment. God, give all of us grace because you are the truth and we want to know the truth, so we pray that you'll expose yourself to us more and more so that we can know you and hear your voice. 
And God, we pray that you'll help us to represent you well in a world that desperately needs you. We pray that we would be Jesus for people who are all around us and uh, that we would point people to Jesus. So we ask for your goodness and for your grace to be given to us. And we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Healer, and our coming King. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you guys.